I'm going to repeat that as soon as our town sound technician has me cue. Nuclear physicist and lecturer Stanton T. Friedman received his BSc and MSc degrees in physics from the University of Chicago in 1955 and 1956 and was employed for 14 years as a nuclear physicist by such companies as GE, GM, Westinghouse, TRW Systems, Aerospace, Aerojet, General Nucleics, and McDonnell Douglas, working in such highly advanced, classified, and eventually canceled programs as nuclear aircraft, fission and fusion rockets, and various compact nuclear power plants for space and terrestrial applications. Charming. He became interested in UFOs in 1958, and since 1967 has lectured about them at more than 600 colleges and 100, oh, one line there, and 100 professional groups in 50 U.S. states, nine Canadian provinces, and 16 other countries, in addition to various nuclear consulting efforts. He has published more than 90 UFO papers and has appeared on hundreds of radio and television programs, including on Larry King. Uh, the double-edged sword of computers. Okay. Um, okay. He's writing a book over here. Yeah, uh, printouts make more sense, don't they? You don't have it memorized? Right, memorize this, you bet. You must be kidding. I'm sorry. Okay, in 2007 and 2008, and many documentaries. He is the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident and co authored Crash at Corona, the definitive study of the Roswell incident, Top Secret Magic, his controversial book about the Majestic 12 group, established in 1947 to deal with alien technology and published in 1966 with an expanded new edition published in 2005. Stan was presented with the Lifetime UFO Achievement Awards in Leeds, England in 2002 by UFO Magazine of the UK and inducted into the UFO Hall of Fame in 2010, I'm very proud to say by me. He is co-author, along with Kathleen Martin, of the absolutely essential reading Captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, and his book, Flying Saucers and Science, was published in June 2008. His newest book, Science Was Wrong, co-authored by Kathleen Martin, came out in June of 2010. He has provided written testimony to congressional hearings, appeared twice at the UN, and been a pioneer in many aspects of ufology, including Roswell, Majestic 12, the Betty Hill Marjorie Fish star map work, analysis of the Delphos, Kansas case, physical trace case, uh, crashed saucers, flying saucer technology, and challenges to SETI, which of course stands for Silly Effort to Investigate <laughs> Cultists. He has spoken at more MUFON symposia than anyone else in the history of the planet Earth, and testified at the People's Hearings on Disclosure held this past April and May at the National Press Club in Washington and did a brilliant job on my dad. Stan Friedman is a dual citizen of the United States and Canada, but in 2007, and in 2007, the city of Fredericton, New Brunswick, which is his home, appropriately honored this New Jersey native by declaring August 27, Stanton Friedman Day. Please give a warm welcome. Two corrections. I've spoken in all ten provinces. And the second correction? I can't remember. Good. <laughs> I'll think of it.
Uh, this is a sort of a different presentation for me. In the first place, I'm pleased to speak in Maine. I live 73 miles across the border in Fredericton. Uh, and there's some new ideas. I also want to compliment my colleague, Kathleen Martin. You rarely see a presentation. She hit her time on right, got everything right. Great. I mean, you can take lessons for how to give a lecture from listening to Kathleen. A few quick comments to begin with. Uh, sort of to set a different tone. First, uh, for those of you who worry about talking about your abduction experience or talking about UFOs or even admitting that you've read a book about the subject, preferably one of ours, uh, in well over 700 lectures, oh, the other correction was 18 other countries, not so. Uh, in all those lectures, and I come on very strong by telling people at the beginning that I'm convinced the planet's being visited by extraterrestrial spacecraft, that we're dealing with a cosmic water gate, that there are no good arguments against those conclusions, and that we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. I'm not namby-pamby about my feelings about flying saucers. Despite coming on so strong, I've had only 11 hecklers, and two of them were drunk. <laughs> and I am told that you'll have many more than that if you talk about sports, religion, or politics. I don't talk about those things, of course. So I want to encourage you, it's okay, is what I'm saying. The second thing, my mantra, if you will, is that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. You have to change how you do things. We sometimes forget that. We think we can move forward from the past and nothing new is going to happen. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. The third thing is that the two words that characterize the scientific and journalistic community's attitude toward flying saucers, and probably other subjects too, are arrogance and ignorance. They think if they don't know something, it, it doesn't exist. It's not real. It's not a fact. They're so smart that they have answers for everything. And they know there are no flying saucers because if there were, they would know about it, you see. <laughs> Interesting circle. And I've debated with these people, these SETI cultists among others, and they don't know what they're talking about. They don't need to do any homework because there's no homework to do. Because if there were, they would already know it. This is a terribly unscientific, irrational attitude. Now, there's some other idea that just occurred to me the past month or so. Kathy and I did a book, Science Was Wrong. In 14 chapters, we each did seven, uh, in which each one was stimulated by some very smart guy saying something very stupid that stood in the way of progress. So, we expect that. But when you look over technological progress, you realize that most of the great discoveries have dealt with things that we cannot see. Bacteria, viruses, neutrons, protons, x-rays, gamma rays, DNA, radio waves, and that's one of the reasons the nasty, noisy negativists were so loud about these things. If it was real, they would have seen it. Man has been done a lot of damage by outstanding leaders saying stupid things because they're dealing with stuff they can't see. And if they can't, nobody else can, obviously. And finally, I'd like to have you think about a question. All this talk, and there is new talk now about a new Drake equation, now called the Sager equation from MIT, a bright woman 
who has reformulated things. But I've heard not one comment from any of these ancient academics and fossilized physicists, <laughs> not one that even suggests that, gee, the smart guys out there that we are hoping will send us radio signals so we can continue with our plush jobs listening for signals, <laughs> nobody has suggested that maybe some of them sent out the equivalent of Kepler maybe 10,000 years ago. Like we're at the top of the heap. And even here in beautiful Maine, I would say earthlings are not at the top of the heap. <laughs> we're a primitive society whose major activity is obviously tribal warfare. But think about that for a minute. They think about all we can do, but ain't nobody out there that could have done that before we did. The earth is over four billion years old. We had our first radio signal long distance in 1901. Remember Marconi? Well, I don't mean remember, none of you were there. But, uh, I've been to the place in Newfoundland that got that signal. And would you believe, all the great scientists said, hey, Marconi, you're crazy. You forgot two important facts. What kind of a scientist are you? Radio waves move in straight lines. Straight lines, straight lines. And in case you've forgotten, the Earth is round. So if you're over here and you want to communicate with somebody a thousand miles away, there's a bit of the planet in the way, buddy. You'll never do it. Well, Marconi had run some experiments with ships bigger distances, and he knew you could send a signal much farther than the, the straight line nonsense. The interesting thing is, it was more than 20, minute, uh, 20 years before we found out why it was possible. Something you couldn't see. That layer of the ionosphere. Charged layer of the ionosphere. We didn't know it was there. So therefore it couldn't be. So there are some morals to these stories is the point. If we're seriously interested in finding out what's going on, in not just Maine or North America or Earth, but you know, in a local galactic neighborhood. We tend to forget that within a nominal 50 light years, there are well over a thousand stars. And I've had astronomers come at me, well, I know how much energy it's going to take to get to Andromeda. And I have to say, I don't give a damn. The Andromeda galaxy is two million light years away. I'm interested in Zeta Reticuli from the Betty and Barney Hill case, 39.3 light years away. There's a little difference. So I'm trying to adjust your thinking a little bit to the real world, not the imaginary world created by these nasty, noisy negativists. Okay. I do have a presentation. Uh, and we'll look at the cosmos. You see, until fairly recently, we could safely say there's one solar system, one group of planets, we're the only life around, we're at the top of the heap, and we're the smartest beings there are. Pat Robertson has extended that a bit. All the intelligent life in the universe is on Earth, he said. This UFO stuff is the work of the devil. He also thinks the world was created in 4004 BC. Thursday afternoon, I think. Uh, rather than, he, he left out six zeros. So four billion four instead of 4004. But it affects your thinking if you restrict your notions to what goes on. Ain't been long, and we're it. That makes life very simple. Not for people who lecture about flying saucers, you understand. <laughs> okay. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. I will try to do as good a job as Kathy did of ending on time. I probably won't, but we'll, we'll do what we can. I thought I'd just push the button and something would happen. <laughs> oh, wrong button. You can barely see the one you're supposed to push. Uh, just, just for kicks, 
This is Chase Brandon and Lee Spiegel. Lee is a fine reporter for the Huffington Post. I was going to say Harrington Post. I don't know where that came from. Now, Chase Brandon was announced as being a former CIA guy who was at a CIA historical facility and looking around and found a box that said Roswell and opened it up and discovered, my goodness, it really happened. And he went sort of public. And I heard about this. I've known Lee Spiegel set up the uh, United Nations UFO session way back in the 70s. I've known him for years. He's a really sharp guy. But what struck me was, wait a minute, Chase Brandon? My movie, UFOs Are Real, the producer of that movie was Brandon Chase. <laughs> and so when I first heard this, I thought, wait a minute, something is fishy here. <laughs> That's a coincidence. It is a coincidence because there really is a Chase Brandon and people interested in movie making and so forth know that he's been the, the CIA go-to man if you're making a movie about the CIA and stuff like that. But, uh, and of course, his comments were viciously attacked by the noisy negativists because remember, there's one basic rule. Anything but alien. If your first explanation doesn't work, try a second, or a third, or a fourth, or a fifth, but anything but alien. Roswell cannot be from outer space. I just had a great argument against it being from outer space. As a matter of fact, see what you think about this. An advanced civilization that can send a spacecraft here from another solar system couldn't possibly crash that system. And I had to point out not very gently, that what crashed wasn't the mothership, but the little Earth excursion module. Think of our aircraft carriers. And I'll show you pictures, but just to get you interested, our big aircraft carriers are nuclear powered and can operate for 18 years without refueling. They carry 75 little jet aircraft that can operate for two hours without refueling. They're not the same. Being able to go close to the speed of light doesn't do you much good around the planet. It only takes a seventh of a second to go around the planet. How do you meet somebody for lunch? I mean, you know, it just doesn't work. Okay. So it's a question of perspective about all these things. I, I can't tell whether you can read that in the back or not. My eyes aren't that great. You can back there? Okay, good. Organized science has been wrong about many aspects. The universe is much larger, much older. SETI and astronomy have made many false claims. We can learn a lot by reviewing them. It used to be that the big shots were convinced there was only one galaxy. And old Hubble came along, young Hubble came along. That's from the Hubble telescope, that guy. He was rewarded because he was persistent. And there was a big scientific meeting, and he was able to show that there were lots of galaxies out there, not just one. The head of the Harvard Astronomy Department was one of those people who said there was only one. How can you be more distinguished than that? Uh, so we were wrong, badly wrong. I mean, what's the difference between one galaxy and a billion billion galaxies? And it's just a little matter of numbers, you know. Um, another one of those, we find out something you couldn't see. In 1938, it was figured out by a smart physicist that pr the process that produces the energy of the stars is not burning gas, even though Lord Kelvin, the great British physicist, insisted that it was. And therefore, that the sun was only 33 million years old, because that's how long it would take to burn it up. So it was 4 billion instead of 33 million, because he didn't know about nuclear fusion. Somebody theorized that. But it didn't take long to run with that. The neutron wasn't even discovered until the 30s. You know, there have been neutrons all over the place for billions of years. <laughs> we didn't even know that they existed. Because if they had, we wouldn't know. Our smart people would have told us that, you know. I know that sounds a little silly, but uh, look at the rapid progress. In 
1944, a big bomb was a 10-ton blockbuster. Made a big hole in the ground, too, that releasing the energy of 10 tons of TNT. And we dropped a lot of them in Europe, made a lot of holes in the ground. Uh, it took a big B-29 to carry that bomb. That was 1944. First fission, nuclear fission bomb went off in 1945. Trinity site released the energy of roughly 16,000 tons of TNT. That's a pretty big jump in a short time. You ain't seen nothing yet. 1952, our first H-bomb. I am not proud as a nuclear physicist, but I am in a sense. Uh, the first H-bomb, named Mike, incidentally, in case you're wondering, released the energy of 10 million tons of TNT. So we go from 10 to 16,000 to 10 million in less than 10 years. And within a few years, the Russians set off an even bigger one, 57 million tons of TNT energy equivalent released. That's mind-boggling. If you dropped one of those in the middle of New Jersey, you'd start fires from Philadelphia to New York. And having grown up there, some people would say, hey, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but the key thing here is that almost all the energy in the universe, so far as we can tell, is produced by nuclear fusion. And not only do we know that now, but everybody smart out there is going to know that. I'm not saying it's the only means, because I'm sure they've learned about things that we don't know about yet. But it, it, it's enough energy to take care of our needs. And if anybody's going to look toward using a lot of energy to do something, like going to another star system down the street, fusion would seem to be the sensible place to look. I worked on a study of fusion in 1961. Why haven't we done it? It costs money. What are you going to do out there? You know, money sort of makes the wheels go around. So, nuclear fusion. Keep those words in mind. Uh, right now, we're not using it to produce energy because we've got other ways of doing it without having to spend extra money. But every advanced civilization will know about fusion. And we'll also be worried when they find out we know about making atomic bombs. Think about that for a minute. Why would anybody come here? Dumb question. Who knows? Ask them. But uh, at the end of World War II, there were three clear indications that soon these idiot earthlings, who had just killed 50 million of their own kind, and destroyed 1,700 cities. That's not a recommendation for visitor accommodation someplace else. <laughs> Three signs that soon we'd be going out there. And if you were an alien, you wouldn't want us out there. Primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. That's a pretty accurate description of this place. I hate to say it, but it's true. The three things, first atomic bombs, second powerful rockets used to kill. We weren't delivering mail from Germany to England with the V-2 rocket for killing. And three, the beginning of the electronics revolution. Radar really began just before World War II in Europe. And that got levered up very quickly. Isn't it amazing, the only place where you could study all three of those things on this planet was southeastern New Mexico. First atomic bomb, Trinity site, grounds of White Sands missile range. That's where we had the German rockets we'd captured and were firing them, and that's where we had our best radar because, uh, hate to admit it, but sometimes they went south instead of north, and the Mexicans weren't very happy about that. Now, admittedly, I was on a uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an English television program, and a very haughty English astronomer said, well, 
they could have gone to the Soviet Union. Uh, sorry, they didn't test their first A-bomb until 1949. There's nothing more haughty than a British astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm setting the stage here, in other words, for a different way of viewing the cosmos. Here are the different fusion reactions, and there's a reason for showing this to you. There are a whole bunch of different ones. And don't let the equations bother you. There's nothing exotic about it. But the best one is the top one. Helium-3 and heavy hydrogen give you these things and 18 million electron volts in charged particles. You say, so what? Well, an electron volt is a measure of energy. Normal chemical reactions use under 20 electron volts or produce, you know, you light a match, you have an internal combustion engine, all these sorts of things. Uh, under 20 electron volts per reaction. One nuclear fusion reaction gives you 18 million electron volts. And you want it to be in charged particles because you can interact with the charged particles with electric and magnetic fields to get them to go out the back of the rocket. Neutrons go out in all directions. That doesn't do you much good if you want to run a rocket, you know. But charged particles, that away, and you go that away. Now, just to give you an idea of how far off those ancient academics can be. There was a study done by Dr. Campbell, a Canadian astronomer, in 1941 to calculate the required initial launch of a rocket able to get a man to the moon and back. Good question. How big does a darn thing have to be? He didn't like all that science fiction stuff. Going to the moon? What are you, crazy? So he published a scientific paper in a journal. Pages of equations, bottom line, the initial launch rate would have to be a million, million tons. The Apollo Command, but the Saturn V with the Apollo on board, it weighed 3,000 tons. In other words, if you want to be inaccurate, do what the astronomers do when they calculate the weight of a rocket. He made every stupid assumption you could possibly make. When he should have known better if he'd done his homework, but of course he knew there was no homework to do because he was a smart guy and he didn't know anything different. He assumed a single-stage rocket, a limit of 1G acceleration, that the rocket has to supply all the energy, that you have to have a retro rocket to slow you down when you come back, too low an exhaust velocity, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, for example, uh, I said he assumed that the rocket has to provide all the energy. He forgot that the moon has a gravitational field. You put the rock in the right place at the right time, and Mr. Moon pulls you in nicely. <laughs> All our deep space probes use cosmic freeloading. Why not? <coughs> and when we come back from the moon, do we use a retro rocket? No. We say it's more important to be smart than powerful. God gave us an atmosphere. Gives us air to breathe, but more important, if you get the angle right when you're coming back, remember Apollo 13? It'll slow you down, too. Free. If you don't get the angle right, you either dig a hole in the ground or you go bye, 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 Earth. <laughs> being smart's more important than being powerful. Now, There are many stupid things that uh, smart people have said. As I said, we have a book about that. But the New York Times outdid itself in 1919 in response to an article by Goddard, rocket scientist from Clark University in Massachusetts, I guess it is. Um, they ran an article. He had published an article in which he casually mentioned that one might be able to use rockets to fly in outer space. The good doctor doesn't even know what any high school student knows, that you can't react against a vacuum, so it's nonsense. They corrected that stupid statement 
because the reaction, you know, Newton equal and opposite reaction kind of thing. You're reacting against the rocket, not against the non-existent atmosphere that's there. They corrected that as the Apollo was heading toward the moon. All the news that's fit to print. A little slow on some of it, of course. But that typifies. Uh, I'll give you another one, too, incidentally. The, uh, the Roswell explanation, that's my favorite. Crash test dummies. Front page, above the fold, on a Sunday in the New York Times. Now, there are two primary things wrong with the crash test dummy explanation. None were dropped until six years after Roswell, so we have time traveled for crash test dummies. <laughs> and I'll show you a picture later. The crash test dummies were six feet tall and weighed 175 pounds and had flight uniforms on. Of course, everybody in New Mexico is so stupid that if they found one, they'd say, oh, the aliens are coming, the aliens are coming. Unthinkable. They never corrected that mistake, incidentally. Okay, so keep in mind, nuclear fusion is what makes the universe work. Not that there won't be a better thing than fusion for propulsion, but I'm saying we already know in our not very advanced situation here that fusion would do the job. There's a mistake there, it should be only 10 million times as much energy per pound as in chemical combustion. What's the difference between 10 million and 10 billion? <laughs> yeah, here's what I was saying at the beginning there about uh, Kepler. I really admire the Kepler spacecraft, it's a, it's a beautiful job. It's looking at a piece of the sky about as big as your fist held at arm's length. Satellite goes out and back, and now it's not working right at the moment, but anyway. They found loads of planets. People say, why don't they look at Zeta Reticuli or any place else you name? It can't. It can only go out in these orbits. There's plenty of stars. And it's extraordinarily sensitive. You know, like a butterfly flying in front of a headlight a mile away, and you can tell the difference in the light coming from it, that kind of thing. But Frank Drake said there might be as many as 8,000 places in the galaxy that could be sending us signals. Give us money so we can listen, and listen, and listen, and listen. <laughs> Do we have any evidence that there's anybody doing that? No. But it sounds good. They will never refer to the UFO evidence, of course. Now with Kepler in our galaxy, it's a safer bet to say there are 8 billion places that could be sending signals. Little improvement between 8,000 and 8 billion. Strange world we live in. There's Frank. Jill Tarter, the model for the movie about Carl Sagan's book, Contact. Jill pontificated about, there might, based on Frank's data, that there might be as many, there, there might be a star as close as a thousand light years, and when we make contact, they, it'll be a great discovery for mankind, and they'll help us solve our problems. Think about that for a minute. Hey guys, we got some difficulty here. A thousand years later, they pick up the message. <laughs> Takes them a thousand more years to send back a response. Hey guys, what can we do for you? <laughs> Does that make any sense to anybody? <laughs> Another great astronomer, the British Astronomer Royals have some track record. Boy. In 1956, they said, space travel is utter bilge. Who's going to pay for it? What good would it do? What we need is better instruments for astronomy. That was a year before Sputnik went up. And what science has benefited most from the space program? Astronomy, of course. But the latest incarnation, Lauren Rees, last year, only kooks see UFOs. Any evidence provided? No. Any reference provided? No. Any sense behind it? No. Not a bit. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. That's the first rule of the debunkers. What the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. If you can't attack the data, attack the people. And he did. 
Why would anybody come here just to talk to the cranks on the planet? By cranks, of course, I would say the Astronomer Royal, but we won't go into that. Uh, the fourth uh, rule is do your research by proclamation. Investigation is too much trouble, and nobody will know the difference anyway. <laughs> Dr. Seth Shostak and I appeared on the Queen Elizabeth II. We each gave three lectures when I talked about five large-scale scientific studies and asked after each one how many here have read this. Of course, he didn't answer yes to any of them. We did a debate on coast-to-coast -coast radio. I got 57% of the, the vote. He got 33. 10% said, I don't know. Uh, and he did say, I. I contact and asked me if I could send him my book, Flying Saucers and Science. We were not antagonistic on board. What are you going to do on in the North Atlantic, have a duel to the death? <laughs> uh, if I could send him my book, Flying Saucers and Science, he said yes, told me where to send it. And many months later, on Coast to Coast, it, it did come out that it was on his nightstand. He didn't say he read it. Oh, no. Strange one. Uh, silly effort to investigate, that's what it means. Yeah, this is this business about how old is the universe, you know. How can anybody beat us to anything new? It's not very long ago that we got started. For th he, incidentally, this is a pornographic <laughs> conclusion. He went through the Bible and looked at all the begatting. And out of that concluded when everything began. <laughs> I'm not lying. That's <laughs> the astronomers will consistently tell you there is no evidence. It's just darn old lights in the sky seen by stupid people out in the middle of nowhere. Forget it. There's five large scale sign. One, two, three, there's four. There's one more. That isn't there, sorry. Uh, Outstanding studies, lots of data, but of course we don't reference them. Don't bother me with the facts, my mind's made up. I, I sort of get a kick out of this cartoon. It's the old story. The cop comes across this drunken guy on the ground, crawling around. But what are you doing down there? I lost my keys. Well, where'd you lose them? Well, over there by the car. Well, why are you looking here? There's more light under the street light. <laughs> I know how to listen for radio signals, so let's figure that's what they're doing. Any sense behind that? No, but it sounds like a good story. Another place where astronomers don't know what they're talking about is uh, about keeping secrets. Uh, yeah, Seth said, as proof that the government can't keep secrets, look what a lousy job FEMA did with Katrina. And look how badly the post office is run. Now what's that got to do with keeping secrets? You know, you've heard of those agencies, DIA, CIA, NSA. You've heard of the NSA a lot recently. Uh, there are a bunch more. NRO is one of my favorites. National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, now, another astronomer, Dr. Tyson, heads the uh, Hayden Planetarium. <laughs> you know about him, huh? He, in a big lecture at Penn State University, said the proof the government can't keep secrets is how much we know about President, President Clinton's genitalia. <laughs> Think about that. That tells you a lot about government operations, doesn't it? It's mind-boggling. The Manhattan Project, at one time 60,000 people worked on that. We built a facility for separating uranium isotopes in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. This is in the 40s. Gosh, it's a fusion plant. It was a mile long. I'm not kidding, a mile long. And it used 5% of all the electricity produced in the United States. That's why it was there, Tennessee Valley Authority, TBA, you know, producing electricity. It was done in secret. In secret. In incidentally, there were a lot of people who saw that first test, 
at Trinity site and called the Sheriff's Department. It was 5.30 in the morning, but made a pretty big light in the sky, if you will. They called the Sheriff's Department, and a couple days later, a press release went out. Fortunately, an ammunition dump that had blown up didn't do any damage. That's what happened. I've seen the newspaper articles. I'm sure some of you believe that some governments might sometime lie a little bit, maybe, just a little bit. But that, that's, I'm not saying they shouldn't have said that. National security is a serious matter to me. But don't think that governments won't lie, because they will. Stealth aircraft cost $10 billion to develop over 10 years in secret. <laughs> One of my favorites is a Corona spy satellite. I've been driving Toyotas for years, you see. So. Uh, it got, the first one, got more data than all the U-2 flights that preceded it. There were 12 failures in secret. Number 13 was the lucky one. It got more data than all the U-2 flights that had preceded it about Russian military facilities. Did we go jumping around on the streets? Look what we did? No. The secret wasn't broken until 1995. And there were lots of people involved. They had a neat way of getting the data back. They had fancy cameras developed in secret by Kodak that used film. Film. Most of you know that there was a thing called film before the <laughs> uh, And they would deorbit then from the satellite and catch it, honest to God, in airplanes, with, basically with a big net, out over the Pacific where nobody could see it, of course. It was very clever, and it worked, and it worked very well. There were a number of successful Corona spy satellites. We've gotten better with the digital age and all that sort of thing, but they had a problem, they came up with a solution, and it worked. And yes, there were 12 failures at the beginning. Something went wrong, hither, thither, yon. But they learned from their failures. And it made an enormous difference in our reactions with the Soviets in knowing what facilities they had. Just like I give Ike credit for admitting that the U-2 was a spy plane. You remember we lied about that, too? Just blown off course by the wind? And then Khrushchev showed the pilot and the plane and the camera, and he didn't take his cyanide pill. We would ask the pilot to take a cyanide pill. You're damn right we asked. And I give Ike credit for saying, yes, it was a spy plane. We have a secret society. We need to know what they're doing. We had one Pearl Harbor. He didn't say that, but I'm sure he was thinking that. But of course there's nothing classified about UFOs, right? Well, uh, yeah, we have a bunch of these top secret Umbra CIA UFO documents. And if you look very carefully, you can read six words on this one. <laughs> and I've had people say, well, Stan, why don't you just scrape off the black? There's nothing underneath. They, did, they Xeroxed them first. They're not stupid. <laughs> I got a whole bunch of these. By their definition, CIA UFO documents. Took me five years to get some of these. Uh, and you know, it gets dull when you start looking at these things. Now, the NSA took a different path. I can get you 156 old NSA top secret number of UFO documents on which you can read one sentence per page. And it's because of me. I called them, I heard they were coming out with new, useful information. And could I get a set? Yeah, what's your name? Stanton Friedman. Oh, we know about you. That's a scary thing to hear from the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, Mr. Philip Class told us that you show blocked out NSA documents on television and don't tell people its sources and methods information. Well, as a matter of fact, I usually do tell them. It's all sources, 98% sources and methods, and 2% UFOs. That's why it's filed under UFO. I mean, that makes sense to some people. 
Uh, and it does get rather dull when you read all this sort of stuff. Uh, one of my favorite statements comes from a general, Air Force General Carol Bolander, who said, he, well, he was given the job, what should we do about Project Blue Book? Because the University of Colorado study said, close it, it's not doing anything useful, which is true. So in 1969, he wrote a memo. He had no, nothing previous to do with it. He was a good engineer. He worked on the lunar excursion module. In his memo, which we didn't see until 10 years later, he said, reports of UFOs which could affect national security are made in accordance with JNAP 146 or Air Force Manual 55-11 and are not part of the Blue Book system. That's an extraordinary statement since we've been told over and over and over again that Blue Book was the group that was looking into UFOs for the government. Two paragraphs later, he says, if we close Project Blue Book, the public won't have a place to report sightings. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated using the procedures designed for that purpose. Every year, the government has said, we have nothing to do since that time. Nothing to do with, you, with UFOs. Project Blue Book was closed. They've lied every single time. Now, the interesting thing is, when I finally got a copy of this, I located Carol Bolander. I like looking for people whose names are not too common. It makes it a lot easier. And I explained, I'd had a clearance for 14 years, and I had read his memo with great interest. And I said, sounds like you're talking about two separate communication channels. One for the cases that which could affect national security, and those for mom and pop seeing a UFO go by, you know, at night. And the example I used for the security ones, if a saucer goes down the runway at a strategic air command base where nuclear weapons are stored, that's a national security problem. Because there ain't supposed to be anybody there besides our good guys. And he agreed. He understood exactly what I was saying. He's dead now and you can't go uh, interview him. But I've seen no major publication, including the New York Times, ever mention this little statement from General Carol Bowen. They never lie. Well, most of the time. <laughs> Technological progress. There's my rule, my mantra comes from doing things differently. And they expect us, the SETI cultists, to believe that aliens are operating at the same level as we are with radio transmission equipment. You know, I used a slide rule when I started work in industry. I don't anymore. I got a real shock in front of a college group in, in Detroit. And I mentioned that, you know, in my lifetime, there's been a lot of technological progress. And I mentioned I used a slide rule. I looked around, there was no reaction at all. So I finally bit the bullet and said, any of you know what a slide rule is? Not one person. And that was less than 50 years earlier, you know. So I doubt if Seth uses uh, a slide book either. <laughs> Another good example, uh, yesterday was the anniversary of the landing in Spain of Magellan's final ship that made it all the way around the world. It took three years, three years. Uh, yesterday, incidentally, was also the day when the Mayflower took off from England to get to New England in 1620 or so. It took three months. And as we've been speaking here, uh, the space station has gone around the planet in 90 minutes. Progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. That's the way it is, like it or not. Some of you may recognize the slide rule, and if you don't, that's all right, you're not so old. Okay, so nuclear rockets, rocket engines. This is Los Alamos' biggest one. Here's the nozzle. This was tested out at the nuclear test site, not far from Area 51, of course. Uh, 
parallel to that little baby, which is about this big in diameter, cooled by liquid hydrogen. 4,400 megawatts. What does that mean? Twice the power of Grand Coulee <coughs> Dam, which is rather huge, to say the least. Back in the 60s, not last week, now, I worked on this one, that's why I show it, at Westinghouse Astro Nuclear Lab, uh, in the little town of Large in Pennsylvania outside Pittsburgh. Back in the late 60s, power level was only 1,100 megawatts. It's only this big. These make great upper stages to send stuff to Mars or the moon or wherever you want. This is nuclear fission. These are real. They were operated. You paid for it. I did work on nuclear airplanes. We paid for that too. In 1958, General Electric spent $100 million on the aircraft nuclear propulsion program. Employed 3,500 people, 1,100 of them engineers and scientists. It wasn't six professors and 12 grad students. And $100 million was a lot of money in 1958. I mean, I know it's cheap change today, but uh, what the heck. Uh, This goes into all the aspects of the scientific side of the question. Uh, there may be a few copies left back there. Oh, just to give you, when I said evidence, the biggest study ever done, Project Blue Book Special Report 14, way back in 1955. They looked at 3,201 sightings. They found 21.5% were unknowns. They found the better the quality of the sighting, the more likely to be unexplainable. And then they lied to the world. They didn't give the title of the report. They quoted the Secretary of the Air Force. Even the, on the basis of this report, we believe that no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. Even the unknown 3% could have been identified as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational <coughs> data had been available. Unknown 3%. The unknowns are 21.5%, which is not 3 rounded off. <laughs> they were completely separate from the 9.3% that were listed as insufficient information. They did a quality evaluation. The better the quality, the more likely to be unexplainable. They compared unknowns and knowns, probability that the unknowns are just misknowns, less than 1%. The New York Times didn't correct that mistake. And there's still people who quote you those foolish numbers. When the government wants to lie, it will. And, you know, I have to, they were clever. The press release didn't say who did the work. Patel Memorial Institute, an outstanding research and development firm, didn't give the names of any of the people involved. Didn't even give the title of the report. If they had spent, said Blue Book Special Report 14, surely some newsman would have said, hey, what do you mean 14? What happened to 1 through 13? We haven't heard anything about them. They were classified, would have been the answer. They got away with it. People ask me, why does the government keep lying about UFOs? Because it works. Because <laughs> the media and the scientific community don't do their job. My University of Chicago classmate, Carl Sagan, quote, the reliable cases are uninteresting and the interesting cases are unreliable. Unfortunately, there are no cases that are both reliable and interesting. <laughs> Any reference given? No. Any source given? No. Is it true? No. The more reliable, the more likely to be interesting. That is unidentifiable. But he got away with it. Actually, he said it a couple of other places besides in this book. Good example of uh, what should I call it? Smart people saying stupid things, I guess. Uh, the date's important 1903, October. Dr. Simon Newcomb, such a distinguished astronomer that when he died five years later, the funeral was attended by the President of the United States. He was a wheel. The demonstration that no possible combination of known substances, known forms of machinery, and known forms of force 
can be united in a practical machine by which man shall fly long distances through the air seems to this writer as complete as it is possible for the demonstration of any physical fact to be. Two months before the Wright brothers first. <laughs> Two months. You notice that word known shows up there. The future comes from discovering what you don't know today, what isn't known today, what you can't see today. Did he know anything about flight? Not a damn thing. But he was believed. And the problem is, it's easy to laugh at stupid things like this, but people are discouraged from doing research when the big shot says it can't be done, it's impossible. That's what we have to be careful of. And the book Science is Wrong has a lot of examples of that. Oh, there's a nuclear submarine on the left. Uh, 1956, first one. During World War II, a submarine was a surface ship that could spend 24 hours underwater. They needed air for the diesel engines. Easy to get air for people, but not easy for engines. Our nuclear submarine goes around the world underwater, comes up for <laughs> periscope viewing when it goes past Hawaii while they're on vacation. <laughs> uh, and there is one of those nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. 18 years is rather impressive without refueling. You replace the crews, of course. <laughs> Uh, there's a secondary thing here. Because the amount of, in a normal carrier, the amount of fuel you consume is dependent upon the rate at which you're moving, how fast you're going. <coughs> you have to be very careful about how you, in wartime, where you're going to get more fuel. So you can't go full speed and all that sort of thing. It changes all your tactics incredibly. With a nuclear power carrier, you can go full steam ahead forever. <laughs> For years, anyway. <laughs> Months. Interesting world out there. They never look at airlines. They act like it's random. When was the last time you got an airplane and the pilot said, uh, folks, where do you want to go today? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder when the flights go to some place elsewhere than the one you want, but you know, why not look around at where there are planets, maybe, where there are stars? Oh, uh, I think I have something about Zeta Reticuli here. Yeah, the Betty and Barney Hill star map. Betty saw the map. It's a long story which I won't go into. A brilliant woman named Marjorie Fish, who just died in April, uh, built 20-some different three-dimensional models of our local galactic neighborhood, and after a lot, a lot of really sharp work. I was the first to publish about it. I met with her and so forth. Uh, concluded that the base stars are Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli. Constellation of reticulum, which you can't see from here, you've got to go below the equator. And they're very special. Those two stars are only a tenth, a, a tenth of a light year apart, which is 30 times closer than we are to the next star over. And they're visible all day long from the other one, which is kind of nifty. And you could directly observe planets around the other one quite easily. And they're a cool billion years older than the sun. I think they would have had time to have the incentive to build interstellar travel a long time ago. And they're only 39 light years away, just down the street. That's exciting. I think there are still a few copies of the capture back there. <coughs> There's Betty and Barney. That's not an alien down there. <laughs> oh, there's one of our great scholars, Dr. Susan Clancy. And tonight you'll hear a paper by two of the people involved in the Allagash abductions. And she, a Harvard PhD, wrote a book about people who think they might have been abducted, clearly saying they haven't been. She tells that story. She has it being two people instead of four. She has one of them writing a book when it was somebody outside it all together. And she's off by 10 years in one year it happened. This is real science from Harvard. Gets a little sick sometimes. 
Majestic 12, Magic 12, MJ 12, set up, I say, by President Truman in 1947 to deal with Roswell and other UFO events. And we got some documents in 1984, which I think are the most classified government documents ever released to the public. I did an enormous amount of work on them. At first I thought, oh, they got to be phony, but Mr. Class thought they were phony, of course. He thinks everything is phony. Uh, and he challenged me on one of the documents. Perhaps I hadn't noticed it was done in the large Pika type. But the tradition at the National Security Council was the small elite type, and he had nine documents to prove it. I challenge you to find any other genuine documents done in the same size and style pica type meeting certain criteria. And I will give you $100 each, up to the maximum of 10, unfortunately. <laughs> of course, he had never been to the Eisenhower Library. I spent weeks there. And I was going there soon. To make a long story short, I went. I found 14 pica type documents. They're easy to, so, to tell. They're bigger. Typeface is bigger. I made copies for him, sent him the copies, and an invoice for $1,000, and he paid me. <laughs> he told everybody about challenging me and nobody about paying me. <laughs> and he got very angry. <laughs> he was, he was going to sue me for publishing his check. His father was an attorney, so he knew how to write those letters, you know. And I said, Phil, look, you sent me a check. I Xeroxed it. I took the check to the bank. They cashed it. I can do whatever I damn please with the Xerox, so get off my back. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> but there is no Stanton Friedman file in the class papers at the American Philosophical Society Library in Philadelphia. Wonder why? I don't think he wanted anybody to know that he made one of many stupid claims. There's the book. There's Kathleen, who you just saw. There's my crash in Corona. Oh, yeah, there's the crash test dummy, so I have to show you. <laughs> the one in the middle is the dummy. <laughs> you notice the flight uniform there. Wouldn't every New Mexican rancher think these were alien invaders? The kicker is I talked to Colonel Madsen, but I met with him in person in Albuquerque. He's dead too now. Uh, and he's the one who stressed that for the test to be meaningful, the dummies had to be the same size and weight as pilots. The uniform's important because it affects drag and heating of when you're coming out of an airplane at 40,000 feet. You freeze before you get down, you know, and what's the drag and all the rest of that. But uh, New York Times didn't correct that. That's in that report. There's another good crash, and I don't have any copies here. It's supposed to be sent, but they weren't. Aztec, New Mexico, northwestern New Mexico, by Scott and Suzanne Ramsey, an incredible amount of effort. I wrote the forward. I'm good at writing forwards. <laughs> Man's not at the top of the heap. We're a threat to the neighborhood. And we're a primitive society primarily involved in tribal warfare. And if you don't believe that, then how come this year we will spend a trillion dollars on things military and every single day 15,000 children will die of preventable disease or starvation? <coughs> and you blame aliens for not wanting us out there? <laughs> Thanks for listening. Oh, I, you got to look at this card too. <laughs> the local paper in New Brunswick, when, I, when uh, Peter named me to the, Hall of, the Roswell Hall of Fame in New Mexico, they read a, a nice article, and then this, uh, it's always nice to be recognized by your peers, it says Roswell UFO Hall of Fame. <laughs> Actually, I think it was pretty complimentary, so I'm pleased. Thank you very much for this. Should I, yeah. should I answer questions? Yes, yes by all means. Okay.